Darn. Bach just may have signed us another assignment. On the Roaring Twenties, Dirty Thirties. <laughs> I wish I knew what Canadian sports were like. 1920s, 1930s. It's Hockey Night in Canada! No, you missed nothing, man. It's just it's just coming back from commercials. They're lining up Taylor, Schreiner, and Carr. On the face-off, it goes to the blue line. Here's a shot. Rhoda kicked that one out. Schreiner rolled it, but not out. Schreiner then rolled it to center ice. And it's right. Shoot it back in. Schreiner gets it. Shoots it ahead. Here's a breakaway. Goldham going right in. He's right in. He shoots. No. He scores. Yeah. Especially after the Great War, the most popular national pastime in Canada was hockey. With the NHL founded in 1917, it was still on the rise and its popularity was increasing. This sport was solely Canadian. Then the NHL expanded into the urban market of the US. When then only two teams were Canadian the Toronto Maple Leafs, and the Montreal Canadiens. The popularity of this sport still influences towns and cities today to play and enjoy the sport. But most players jump big, however little will able to achieve success in this ever-expanding sport. Since the sport was still in its roots, players were encouraged to play hard and become the best. It was any kid's dream to become rich and famous by playing hockey. Canada's true colors shined in the 1920s Olympics held in Antwerp, Belgium. A team named the Winnipeg Falcons represented Canada. The Falcons were part of the Manitoba Hockey League. The first place team of the Manitoba Hockey League would play the champion of the Winnipeg Hockey League for the opportunity to represent Western Canada in the Allen Cup playoffs. The Falcons beat the Selkirk Fishermen 5-3 to claim the Manitoba Hockey League championship. After the team's success in the Allen Cup playoffs, the Falcons were chosen to represent Canada in the 1920s Olympics. The team would play against Czechoslovakia, Sweden, and the United States in the tournament. The Canadian team easily beat Czechoslovakia with a score of 15 to nothing. Then played a tough match with the US, winning only 2 nothing. And finally, beating Sweden 12 to 1 to claim a gold for Canada. Upon their return home, they were given a hero's welcome, and the newspapers described them as hail champions of the world. The players that were in the 1920s Winnipeg Falcons were Robert John Benson, Jacob Walter Byron, team captain Franklin Fredrickson, Chris Fritfinson, Magnus Goodman, Conrad Johansson, Alan Woodman, and Halder Halderson. Five of the nine medals that Canada was awarded were within the boxing category. There was only one gold earned, and it was within the welterweight division, with the boxer named Albert Schneider. Albert Schneider was an American-born athlete who moved to Montreal at the age of nine. And instead of playing for the American side, he chose to fight for the country that he was raised in, supplying us with one more gold medal. Other Canadian boxers included Clifford Graham, who won silver in men's bantamweight, Georges Prudhomme, who won silver in men's middleweight, Clarence Newton, who won bronze in men's lightweight, and Moe Hershkov, who won bronze in men's middleweight. Another gold medal that Canada won was thanks to Earl Thompson, who participated in the men's 110 meter hurdles. He set a new world record there, finishing it in 14.4 seconds. Earl Thompson first sought out to represent the United States at the 1920 Summer Olympics, but was ruled ineligible due to his Canadian citizenship. He then joined the Canadian Olympic team, and at the Olympics, Thompson won a clear victory over his American rivals. The following year, he equaled his own world record and won the AAU 
IC4A, and NCAA championships. That year, he also won the 220-yard low hurdles. He retired his third AAU title in 1922. The remaining silver and bronze medals were earned by George Vernon in men's 1500-meter freestyle and men's 400-meter freestyle in the swimming category. Overall, Canada won nine medals, three of them gold by Bert Schneider Boxing, Earl Thompson Athletics men's 100-meter hurdles, and the Winnipeg Falcons. Canada also earned three silver medals, thanks to Clifford Graham for boxing men's bantamweight, Georges Prudhomme for boxing men's middleweight, and George Vernon swimming men's 1,500-meter freestyle. Canada also earned three bronze medals, thanks to Clarence Newton for boxing men's lightweight, Mo Hershkov for boxing men's middleweight, and George Vernon for swimming men's 400-meter freestyle. However, outside the Olympics, another team rose above all odds. The team was named the Edmonton Grads. Outside of the Olympics, another team rose above all odds. They started as a high school women's basketball team, but before their popularity boosted, they first had to overcome gender equality rights. The 1920s marked a breakthrough for women, especially in 1926, when the Women's Amateur Federation Canada, WAAF, was formed. This federation worked hard to allow women to compete in international competition and to rebuke stereotypes like vigorous physical activity and intense comp competition was unwomanly. The WAAF forged an alliance with supportive men who dominated the Amateur Athletic Union of Canada. This alliance allowed women to compete in the Olympics and the British Empire Games, also including other major tournaments. In Edmonton, a high school basketball team starts to gain popularity around its community. In the early 1900s, when the sport basketball was still in its roots, it was believed that it was a sport that delivered a good physical activity that also was fun and could be played by all. However, in 1914, one team stood out and gained popularity in Canada. They went by the name the Edmonton Grads, who were a women's basketball team. Their coach, Percy Page, who in 1914, at the age of 27, was put in charge of classes in a new school called McDougal Commercial High School. After the team won provincial championships, they decided to stay together after graduation. Thus, the popular name was born. Until 1922, the team had little popularity outside of Canada, but this would change in a matter of one game. The team was invited to the East-West Final to play the London Shamrocks. However, a problem arose. They didn't have enough money to travel there, so only six made it. The team lost the first game, but won against the champions 41-8 to in the second game. And f from then, everything went uphill. The grads had four Olympic victories, and these ladies also even played against professional male teams, winning seven out of nine games. Get the fixing course. Get out of here. This is a man's court. What are you talking about? This sport's for everyone. No, it's not. This is a sport for men. Give me that. What are you talking about? Are you challenging me? Obviously. Let's go. Well, just because I'm a woman, don't, don't take it easy on me. No. Alright? Let's go. Let's play with men's rules. Check up. I told you not to underestimate the women. I'm not, I beat you right now. Whatever. Good game. Good game, fella. Have a good one. See you. Many countries have claimed the origins of golf, but in reality, the game of golf can be traced to Scotland. In 1457, Parliament banned the game so that more time would be spent on archery practice, which was necessary for Scotland's defense at the time. Following 1501, repeal of the ban, the game prospered. The Honorable Company of Edinburgh Golfers was the world's first golf club, organized in 1744. Golf courses also have their own story. 
The first golf course were on links, which was, was a term commonly used for public land close to the sea. This land would be used by locals to graze their sheep, play games, and other activities. Golfers wore a red coat to warn others that golf ball might be coming their way. Since the courses were quite big, and uh, the equipment were also very heavy, so the cattle, the essential part of early golf. Not only carrying the player's clubs under his arm, but also making out the course and spotting the flight of the ball. Caddies survived the introduction of the first golf bags in 1880s. But the popular use of pull carts and motorized golf cars has all but brought an end to this colorful aspect of the game. The traditional 18-hole rounds we have played today can be credited to the old course in St. Andrews. The original layout was 22 holes, 11 holes out, and the same 11 been back. But eventually they decided that two of the holes were too short. They combined two holes, which made the course 9 out of 9, back in the standard 18 holes were of golf was born. Unlike most sports like baseball, soccer, basketball, tennis, etc., golf is one of the only games which is played on an ever-varying playing field. The rules are to set the address the vastly different circumstances this can bring about and establish equality between players. The original 13 rules have been expanded to 34 rules and 20,000 words. In addition, there is a 599-page decision on the rules of golf book that explains and interprets the rules under actual playing conditions. Also, the equipment was very expensive. A golf ball was as exp expensive as uh, your suit of clothing. Until the 1850s, the golf ball was handmade, expensive, and extremely fragile. Far from round, the feathery was made by stitching sections of leather into a sphere, then stuffing it with the equivalent of a top hat full of feathers. An experienced ball maker could produce only four balls a day. To tee the ball, early golfers scooped up a handful of earth or sand into a mound and placed the ball on top. Later, they used a sand tee mold. The first commercial wooden tee was introduced in 1921, and soon after, golfers were overwhelmed with advertisement for tees of all shapes and sizes. Today, the standard wooden tee is a staple of the game. Man, am I sure to play golf today? All right, Charles, give me a pile of dirt, will ya? There you go. Beauty. Let me just uh, place that, and we're on our way. Wait, hold on. Why would you use a pile of dirt when you can make this stick right here that I made at home? Really simple idea, and uh, forget the dirt. Simple. You just stick it down on here. Place the golf ball. Just put the golf ball down, and there you go. You got a perfectly nice way to keep your golf ball up, and you don't need a pile of dirt. The first golf course in Canada, as everywhere, were made mostly by nature. Our first golf professionals improved them, but not until a year prior to the First World War did Canada recruit one of the new golf course architects to design, the first of many courses that have lasted a long time. With the development of golf professionals, came a need to test the, these leaders of the game for skill. The Canadian Open Championship was initiated for this purpose in 1904, and this was the third oldest national Open Championship in the world. The greatest change in professional golf in modern era was the creation of a semi-permanent home for the Canadian Open at Glen Abbey Golf Club. With improved opportunity for spectators and cons consistent conditions for the golfers, the Jack Nicholas designed course has produced many great champions. The introduction of a Canadian tour as a testing ground for young golfers has expanded the number of Canadians competing around the world, as well as the quality of professional golf in Canada. Golf served as one of the first sports that encouraged the participation of women. The resulting popularity brought about the First Ladies Open Championship. Held in Britain in, in 1893, Canada followed the suit holding the first Canadian Ladies' Championship in 1901. The history of competitive golf in Canada truly begins with the first Canadian amateur in 1895. Since then, golfers have sought to demonstrate their skill. Improvements in transportation and the changing demands of work and life have enhanced the competitive opportunities. A new world emerged at the close of World War I. The widespread introduction of the radio and other communications, the better transportation and services, and the new commitment to the enjoyment of life was reflected in the world of golf.
was at its peak of public interest, especially the match play Canadian amateur. Professional golf was just beginning to draw attention, and Canadians competed successfully internationally and were the subject of nation pride. Horse racing was even faster and more nerve-wracking in the 1920s than it is today. These horses race around the track like flying bullets, leaving only their hoof prints behind in the dirt. The automobile allowed people to travel all around the country to see the famous horses and their riders. The radio allowed people who couldn't afford it and people who didn't have the time to go to listen to the exciting races and be a part of the action. With the Great War finally over, there was more leisure time. This meant more time to go and watch the races, thus making horse racing one of the most popular sports of the decade. In 1922, the Shosun Racing Club, the nation's first ever authorized horse racing club, was established to make horse racing more systematic and better organized. The stars of these shows were the horses, and some names were much more popular than others. Some popular horses were Regret, the first filly to win the Kentucky Derby, Gainsboro, winner of the English Triple Crown and leading sire, Master Charlie, awarded 1924 American champion two year old male colt. Seabiscuit. He was a champion thoroughbred racehorse in the United States. A small horse, he had an inauspicious start in his racing career, but became an unlikely champion and a symbol of hope to many Americans during the Great Depression. The horse managed to bring about $438,000. He was considered the best horse in America. Seabiscuit was the subject of many films and books. Some of them included a 1949 film, a book called The Story of Seabiscuit, and another book, An American Legend, by Laura Hillenbrad. And finally, a 2003 film, which was nominated for the Academy Award for Best Picture. What we can say about horse racing is that I gave the people some joy to their hearts by watching, listening to the events that instantly began to become a part of Canadian and American history. I'd give the world to be among the folks.